Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this morning. My name is Tamara Tucker, and I am the program coordinator at the Lifelong Learning Center. As we begin today, I acknowledge that the University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 territory with a presence in Treaty 6. These are the ancestral territories of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. This has been an important part of our history and will be equally significant for our future. Today's presentation that you're here to attend is called We Are All Connected, Indigenous Climate Action in the Americas. Our speaker is Paulina, who is currently a PhD candidate at the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Regina. Her research focuses on transnational advocacy networks supporting Indigenous women environmental leaders in the Americas. In 2020, she was awarded with, the, with a Canadian Queen Elizabeth Scholarship as an incoming advanced scholar. I also want to highlight that Paulina is new to the Lifelong Learning Centre, but she is not new to teaching. Before coming to Canada to study, Paulina was a lecturer in Ecuador. So as our presentation gets started today, please ensure that your microphone is muted. Uh, you're welcome to have your camera on if you wish, um, but sometimes people do find that having the camera on can make their um, audio a little bit slower, uh, depending on their Wi-Fi speed. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat function and we'll do our best to either answer them in the chat function or um, Paulina can um, take questions up at the end. All right, thank you so much for being here today, Paulina. I'm going to turn the session over to you to take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamara, and thank you everyone for being here this morning. I will start sharing my screen with my presentation today. Hold on. Okay. I hope you can see that. Um, okay, thank you very much. But it will be better if we start from the beginning. So thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Paulina Larreategui. As Tamara said it correctly, my last name is very difficult to pronounce. So I really appreciate Tamara um, saying it correctly. Um, today, I will share with you some of the preliminary and partial results from the Queen Elizabeth scholarship that I conducted last year. And I want to set up some um, ideas of what to expect from this presentation. Um, firstly, I want to, um, to talk about uh, the current climate crisis from the environmental justice perspective. And this brings us to the point that when we talk about climate change, when we talk about the environmental crisis, we can talk about it in, from, a very, from very different perspectives. But most importantly, we have to talk uh, about it from an intersectional perspective, which means that we cannot talk about environmental um, responses or challenges without reflecting on the economic and also social challenges as well. We will also talk about connection, and that's the title of the presentation, right? We are all connected. And I bring up these. Um, phrase or this quote from Patricia Walinga, um, who is an indigenous environmental leader, because when I interviewed her last year, she was mentioning how we are all connected to her fight. She has um, long um, experience fighting for environment uh, and for social equity in her community. And she always mentioned how we are all connected to that, even though we are not part of that community. So um, I wanted to reflect on that. And I thought that for this presentation it would be super nice if we can all uh, think about how we can all be connected uh, to that and also how we can support their, their fight. Um, so we will connect this local indigenous environmental initiatives. And I will share with you two very interesting initiatives from South America and from Ecuador. One is the Living Forest from Sarayaco and the other one is the Sacred Headwaters from in, in Ecuador and Peru. And also the intergovernmental bodies um, that are discussing this issue and that are very famous now. We are hearing about the COP meetings, the Conference of Paris that are part of the United Nations Framework 
Convention on Climate Change, and also other international agreements that are um, pursuing or are uh, working towards uh, fighting against climate change. So um, I want to share with you one specific one that is the Escazú uh, agreement at the regional level in, in Latin America, which I think it will be super interesting to, to analyze or to reflect on when we are talking about connection, especially when we are talking about participation, public participation, and you will see why. And of course, we will see how we are all connected from these levels, even though if that, it doesn't hear, it doesn't look like we're individuals that we have our lives um, in this national local level. We are very connected to these intergovernmental bodies, to the COP meetings, for instance. I want to see how we can also be connected to that, how we are really all connected to this, but we are also connected also to the indigenous environmental initiatives. And I want to also uh, um, mention my positionality here. I'm an Ecuadorian mestiza, as Tamara mentioned it before, I'm a PhD student at the Joson Shoyama Graduate School, School of Public Policy here at the University of Regina. And I am a lecturer, lecturer in leave of absence from the Catholic University at, um, at Quito, Ecuador. Uh, and as in my position as um, Ecuadorian mestiza, I had the chance to have interviews with indigenous women leaders that are uh, working towards um, tackling climate change. So my interest here is to enhance those voices. I don't mean to um, include my voice in that. I am uh, an ally. I consider myself an ally to these indigenous initiatives. So as an ally, as a mestiza, I am here to enhance those um, indigenous voices. And I want to invite you to look for ways to support them too. That's, that's my positionality here. Um, so why do we talk about environmental crisis nowadays? Um, um, this is a big discussion because some of the, um, some authors on, or some sectors will say that we are not into an environmental crisis that way, but there are other sectors and other academic references that really are really talking about how we are reaching a point where we cannot talk about a crisis because we are living in a, in a moment where environmental hazards are causing infrastructure damages. For instance, in Sarayaku last year, um, rivers, <clears throat> the level rivers raised so high that they destroyed two very important bridges. And when I am talking about rising, I, I talk about more than 20 meters of rise, of uh, right, level rise. So having, more than 20 meters of water destroyed two very important bridges for the community. And that caused, of course, several um, damages uh, to the community as well. Um, these environmental hazards are also causing forced displacements of the communities because they can't live in those spaces anymore, are causing health problems, and of course, food insecurity. It is not an issue, an easy issue to, to talk about. It's a very complex issue that is involving, as I said before, intersectional um, factors, right? We are talking about environmental, social, economic factors that are also um, impacting uh, more, more vulnerable people than others, like indigenous peoples and other groups are more vulnerable to these hazards. And there are also different actors involved, um, not only local um, actors as indigenous communities or groups as we, I am saying now, but also national governments and intergovernmental uh, bodies and also non-governmental actors, NGOs that are, have opposing interests as uh, mining companies, for instance, or people that are working towards more um, extractive companies or extractive actions. But in, here for this presentation, and um, in order to analyze or to give a space to reflect on connection and also support to environment um, 
and in, in environmental indigenous groups. Here we are going to talk about environmentalist actions. And of course, as I said before, when we are talking about environmental crisis, we can talk about it from very different perspectives. We can talk about science, we can talk uh, from uh, physics, we can talk from biology, for instance. In here, we're going to talk about uh, social science and more specifically, I'm going to refer to this topic from an environmental justice um, perspective. And of course, there are different levels, um, transnational, intergovernmental, national, and local level. And we will see how all of these are connected. So I will jump into the intergovernmental spaces. I will talk about first the Conference of Paris, which is uh, one of the main bodies that we are now hearing in, in the news. The COP meetings um, are the supreme decision-making bodies of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the UNFCCC. The objective of this uh, COP, um, of these COPs are reviewing national communications and the mission inventories and to promote the effective implementation of the UNFCCC. And of course, there are lots of um, criticism. There, there's a lot of criticism around the COP meetings and if they are effective of, or not. The first one was in Berlin in 1995. We saw the last one just in November last year in Glasgow. And the next one, the COP27, will be in, in Egypt 2023. But after the COP, what are the terms of what, what, how how do we see these, um, these results or where are we in terms of these international commitments? And I just put it here, like not enough international commitments because we can see that there's a lot of criticism around, around the agreements that we are achieving there. Um, so the first one is, oops, I'm sorry about that. What did I do? I'm really sorry. Here I am again. So the first one is the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, this is um, a new document that it was signed in the last minute in, uh, in Glasgow. And it, 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 there is a perception that um, with this pact, there is a new collective commitment to achieve the different stuff like to curb methane emissions, reserve forest loss, for instance, to align finance sector with net zero to 2050, for instance, uh, or to abandon the internal um, combustion engine or accelerate the phased out of coal. I mean, all the, um, the measures that were mentioned in the previous COPs, apparently this new Glasgow Climate Pact are bringing that to the next level. For me, one of the biggest contributions on, in this COP was the permanent reference to the need of a collective action, probably because that is where we are all involved. And of course, there were other um, new commitments, like there were new national determined um, contributions for each country. So each country had to, new, had to make new commitments. And there is a revision of the least developed countries found. You know that there is a fund that was created for to support least uh, developed countries in terms of loss and damage mechanism, which is um, a fund that supports the le least developed countries um, to tackle harms caused by anthropogenic climate change. So there was a revision for this found, which means that developed countries have to adjust their funding for least developed countries in terms of uh, paying forward or um, making it up for uh, loss and damage. And there's a new declaration, which is called the Just Transition Declaration. This was signed by Global North uh, countries, Canada included and some of the European Union countries as well. Let me check, I'm, okay, so, sorry, sorry about that, sorry about that. Okay, so one of the, 
one of the main actors that was that has been part of the COP or the Conference of Paris has been the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. This was found in 2008 as a caucus for indigenous peoples in the United Nations um, Framework Convention for Cli on Climate Change. And it holds members from the seven regions, Africa, the Arctic, Asia, North America, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Pacific and Russia and the Eastern Europe. And it has a very specific mandate, which is to uh, facilitate an agreement on what indigenous peoples will be negotiating in each of the conference of parties. And they have representatives from all these seven regions. And I have a quote here that I want to read for you. And it, it is from the, the, the web page of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum. Indigenous peoples representatives attending the meetings have their own organizations at subnational, national, and global levels, which have their own agenda, priorities, and own proposals that may carry and push for um, during the Indigenous People Caucus meetings. And in the last COP, in COP26, the international Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change brought some very inter interesting results. One was the adoption of a work plan for 2022 to 2025 uh, of the local communities and the Indigenous Peoples Platform. And this is a very um, interesting work plan because included includes all the seven regions, but it recognizes and acknowledges also the specific needs of each region and represent representatives of each community also brings up their own initiatives and their own struggles and their challenges. And mostly they put together ideas um, to present afterwards in these intergovernmental bodies as the um, COP meeting. The Glasgow Pact was, uh, it, it's very crucial for indigenous peoples in the paragraph 62, recognizing loss and damages caused by climate change. And this is something kind of new in terms of uh, recognizing broad range of stakeholders at the local, national and regional level, including indigenous peoples and local communities. And then, um, this is important for um, formal reasons, but also it gives the um, lead to indigenous peoples and also local communities that are working on specific initiatives because these will link directly to funding and um, financial funding for many of these initiatives is crucial, right? So one of the things that indigenous peoples are suggesting is that there must be a way to, um, to um, assure that all these uh, funding will go directly to in the indigenous initiatives. There's one quote that I want to share with you because from this quote, I will put together two connections that I feel it will be the starting point of our discussion today. From uh, Avex Nin Kochti, uh, who was a um, COP26 delegate, um, we have this quote here. Now more than ever, indigenous peoples and other movements will continue to unify to pressure states to respect indigenous rights, human rights, and free prior and informed concern. Parallel to this process, it is important to reflect on the consumerism in our households, especially in developed countries as consumers, con con consumers are the final clients of what is produced from extractivism. Over and over, I heard elders say at COP26, take only what you need and use it wisely. So you can see here that there are two premises uh, that I will, um, that, 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 that will help us to connect directly to indigenous initiatives, intergovernmental uh, bodies, and our role there. What can we do to support these, these initiatives in these intergovernmental uh, governments? And the first one is about pressuring states to respect indigenous women, indigenous rights, 
human rights and free prior and informed concern, um, uh, informed consent. So how to pressure states? Well, indigenous peoples and local communities usually work on collective actions. And nowadays one platform that is very useful is the transnational networks. I have, um, I have included here the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network as one a transnational advocacy network that is very effective working with women indigenous women and fem with, with a feminist uh, perspective, working towards um, environmental and human rights. The other, another way to pressure states is also being part of regional agreements. Um, and of course, I will bring here one um, regional agreement that was signed, that came in effective last year, which is the Escazú, Escazú Agreement. This is the regional agreement on access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and this is a very important document now in terms of environment, human rights in Latin America, because it brings two very important matters on the table. The one is that environmental rights um, is equal as human rights. So, they bring up the um, protection to the nature as a protection to, to people. And this, this is similar to some of the constitutions uh, in, in Latin America where they give subject um, rights to nature, right? Like for instance, in Ecuador, the constitution recognized mother earth as a person. And the second, um, very interesting contribution of this agreement is that it gives direct protection to environmental human rights defenders. As you know, in Latin America, the rates of people that, um, the, the, the rates of uh, martyrs or persecution to human rights and environmental human rights defenders is rising every day. And um, with this agreement, governments um, governments uh, need to put in, in place some measures to really defend um, or to protect environmental human rights defenders. Of course, this agreement was just um, started to, 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 to put in place last year. So there's a still a need to each country to, to see how to implement this agreement. But having this agreement as a regional one helps uh, groups in Latin America and the Caribbean to, um, to, to facilitate their actions, right? Their collective actions too. Um, there are two local initiatives that I want to talk about today. And there are two examples in South America that I feel that it will be interesting to, to share this morning. One is the living forest in the Sarayacu community in Ecuador. And the other one is the Amazon sacred headwaters, um, which is taking place in um, South, uh, South Ecuador and North Peru. So the first one is the living forest. This is um, a declaration that um, is, um, is part of the, the indigenous Quechua people of Sarayacu in Ecuador. This community has been internationally recognized and has been known as uh, they won an inter-American court case in 2012. They are still struggling because there are some mines, for instance, in their country that they have to be removed. In this case, they were against one Argentinian company that wanted to exploit oil and the Ecuadorian state give, gave all the permissions to do that. So this was a very um, important case because um, the Sarayaku people won against the Ecuadorian state and they had to remove all the mines on, and all the, um, the preliminary actions that this Argentinian company was taking place. Uh, although nowadays they are still fighting because there are some places in their territory where they still have mines, for instance, and they can't go into that territory. 
but mainly they defended the right to the free prior and informed consent, which is uh, one of the biggest um, issues that we have in Ecuador. And I am learning that here in Canada, many people, many indigenous peoples have that struggle too. The second, so that, that's like an example of a local initiative um, working on um, public policy declaration in terms of this is a declaration where the community states clearly that they don't want extractive companies into their territory and they are requesting the government to respect their right to not have um, these third party companies come into their territory to explode, to explode them. Another initiative, and this is a B-regional or B-lateral or B-national initiative um, that I also feel that it's very interesting to share. And this is the Amazon sacred headwaters from Ecuador and Peru. And this is a B-regional plan to permanently protect the Amazon sacred headwaters from industrial exploitation. And it involved more than 20 indigenous communities and also key stakeholders. It has nine strategic pillars of sustainable development of uh, the sacred water region. And um, differently from the Sarayaku, they have worked on nine um, strategic plans working towards very specific areas like education, intercultural healthcare, transportation, renewable energy, forest conservation, etc. I will I would like to share one um, video from from them. So I will stop sharing my presentation now so I can share with you again. Hold on. Let me know if it works. I hope it works. Hold on, hold on. Hold on again. Sorry. This is a little bit tricky. Hold on. It doesn't work. <laughs> I promise it worked when we um, tried with Tamara at the beginning. Oops. Okay. Does it work now? There you go. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's see if it works now. And Maybe. breathes out oxygen. Its billions of trees lift water vapor into the sky, forming massive flying rivers that bring rain to the entire continent and help regulate the Earth's climate. But this great forest is being destroyed at the rate of seven football fields every minute, cleared for farmland and logged for lumber. Oil drilling and mining pollutes rivers and poisons land, threatening the lives and livelihood of indigenous cultures. Yet here, at the headwaters of the Amazon in Ecuador and northern Peru, one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on Earth, the rainforest remains nearly untouched. The indigenous people who live here consider the region sacred and for decades have been successful in fending off extractive industries. The battles have been constant and unrelenting, and now they are taking unprecedented action to protect this area permanently. 18 indigenous nations have united to form an alliance to protect more than 60 million acres of rainforest as a sanctuary for nature and for humanity. The Sacred Headwaters of the Amazon Initiative is advancing a long-term vision focused on indigenous stewardship of forests and biodiversity and supporting the livelihood and well-being of local communities. This bold initiative will provide a model for the entire world, not only for safeguarding rainforests and keeping fossil fuels in the ground, but also for creating a mutually enhancing human-Earth relationship that is so vital to the future of all life on this planet.
Okay. So I wanted to share that video with you so you can see what they are talking about. And now I will go back to my presentation here. So as we saw in these um, two different initiatives, one in a local setting, um, working on a declaration that is promoting their rights. And the other one, it's a B regional uh, initiative working on a specific pillars or working towards uh, protecting the environment, but also enhancing the, the rights of the indigenous peoples. Um, we, I, I, I want to go back to this idea of how we are connected to that. And um, I want to share with you what Patricia Walinga and other indigenous in, uh, environmental human rights leaders shared with me during the, the research. And the one, the, 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 I have three, three main ideas from them. The first one is that the fight of indigenous peoples protecting their lands involves all of us, including outside indigenous territories. And the second one is that they defend their way of life. Uh, and while they are doing that, they help all of us and our future generations to live in a healthy environment. And the third one is that there is a call to support indigenous in, the, in, in each initiatives at different levels. And um, I was wondering what the support means, like how can we support these indigenous initiatives, you know, answering to this call that they are making. And I have five very simple ideas and maybe they are very obvious and I, I would love to, to listen to other ideas. And I'm sure many people here in this call have other um, initiatives, another way to say that. And I would love to, 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 to hear that from, from you as well. The first one is to find indigenous organizations or movements that are working towards environmental justice. This is to say that nowadays it is very easy to find things online and we can always look for organizations that are working towards indigenous human rights, indigenous environmental rights and supporting them directly. The other thing is to listen to indigenous voices directly. Again, now with, um, with all the COVID restrictions, there are many online meetings where indigenous peoples are sharing their initiatives, they are sharing their thoughts, their challenges as well. And I am here just sharing with you what they shared with me, but maybe my, my call will be um, find those voices directly because th those voices are powerful and they have lots of uh, meaning to say as well. Be part of transnational, national and local alliances, meaning that there are very different organizations like Amnesty International, like WECAN, Women's Earth, um, and Climate um, Action Network, who are working directly with indigenous groups, who are involved in indigenous women, indigenous leaders that are really, they are not only holding the, trans, um, the traditional knowledge, but they, are, they also have initiatives to, um, to tackle this environmental crisis. Spread the word, which means enhancing indigenous voices, um, sharing what you have learned, sharing what you have heard, but also sharing, sharing it from your heart and sharing it also from the need of um, making our voices louder and act responsibly. And I will, um, and, and I think this idea of act responsibly really links to the second part of the quote from, from our COP26 delegate that I mentioned before, which is related to consumerism and how we um, need to reflect in two ways. We need to reflect as customers, especially in the global north, because we are the final consumers of products that are obtained through extractive um, actions. So just keep in mind, and I, I, I always remember this phrase from, from this quote that says, 
take only what you need and use it wisely because that is not only the responsible way to do it, but also the way that you can um, support indigenous peoples and support the environment as well. And there's a third way um, that we can reflect as consumers, uh, which is pressuring banks to defund old and extractive industries. And this is a, like a big uh, movement now, how to, um, how to pressure banks to stop funding oil and extractive oils, especially in the, in the global south. But also mindful consumption will mean different things or additional things. One will be to support politically the candidates that are allied with indigenous, uh, with, <coughs> sorry, allied to environmental justice. So um, take your time when, when elections come, take your time to listen to the proposals and to be, be, try to be mindful and to understand what is their position about environmental justice and indigenous uh, rights as well. There are also governmental initiatives that we can follow and that's part of what we consume as well. Um, there's the Canadian National Adaptation Strategy taking place this year. Um, they have five different areas where they are working on. So maybe following this initiative and if you feel that you can get involved or you want to be involved, try to contact them. There's a web page and it is, um, there, there, there are many people participating in that. There are some experts in each, um, in each area that you can contact and be part also of those discussions, learn more and also um, give your suggestions. And of course, um, my, my last idea will be following government's actions in intergovernmental meetings, right? To know what the delegations are saying, what governments are uh, proposing on, in, in these um, meetings and try to know what the, what's their position. That would be important for all of us. That's the way that we will be connected. So I want to wrap up here with some ideas and I would really like to hear from you, your questions, your comments, your ideas, and to put together more um, nice ways to, to feel connected. But in conclusion, we are all connected. So we can also be part of the solutions to the environmental crisis, which means that if we feel the connection um, in this sense, we can also feel that we can be part of the solution. And being part requires some actions at different levels and in different ways. You don't need to be a huge activist to support um, or to feel that you support some of these initiatives or actions, but you can get involved in different ways and in different levels. Um, just try to be open and learn from others will be also um, a first step. To, to, to feel this connection and to start supporting environmental uh, and human rights actions. Uh, support others' initiatives. There are many different initiatives, local initiatives, uh, transnational initiatives that you can be part of and try to be consistent. And probably this is the most difficult one because we all have different issues that we have to work on. So probably you turn off the lights when you go out of a room, right? Because you don't want to waste um, electrical energy, but maybe you love um, buy, buying clothes, for instance, or you can't resist a sale and you buy things that you don't need at home. So, being consistent um, means also challenge ourselves as trying to be a good person or someone that uh, protects the environment or someone that is um, uh, actually worried about indigenous peoples and indigenous human rights. And of course, the last one will be registered to the class that will start in two weeks in January 25th. Uh, this class will be on climate change and in, on indigenous climate actions, and we will have the chance to reflect on different things. Uh, we will go through other international agreements, um, very interesting initiatives. Um, we will see the Berman reports, for instance. The Berman report is very interesting in terms of human rights and environment. Uh, we will see the Dagospa review. We will see other initiatives in Latin America. We will touch base also 
on some um, Canadian cases here, there are very different indigenous initiatives uh, here in Canada that um, are worth mentioning and are worth studying a little bit in, in, in deeper, right? So um, I think I will, I will stop here because I would really like to hear from you. And if there are some questions, some comments, I will be really happy to, to have a conversation with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paulina. And we do have one question uh, in the chat. It says, is it possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint? I'm happy to help with distributing that if you're willing to share it. Yeah, for sure. If you don't mind, I will pass it as a PDF. Okay. And of course, if someone would like the links, for instance, for the Sarayaku Initiative or the um, uh, Amazon Sacred Headwaters link, I will be really happy to share those two. I mean, I will do that in the chat now. In the chat now. So okay. if, if you would like to to have it as well, but I will be happy to share the the presentation. Thank you. Okay, sounds great. And I see Terry has her hand up. Good morning. Thank you, Paulina. You've done a great job. Thank I you. just want to reiterate what uh, my friend Sue Derange said. We're all experienced experiencing climate catastrophes. But she said, you know, the indigenous people suffered that many years ago and no one listened to us. Now all of us are getting to experience it because we did nothing. It was, it was a warning to others that we ignored. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And thank you for bringing that up. When I interviewed people from Sarayaku and when I interviewed the director from the sacred waters, uh, headwaters in the Amazon, they were also reflecting on how important it is from them to be heard and to listen to their voices. And I agree that they also mentioned that all these um, environment hazards that they are experiencing now, they are not new, but some of the people in Sarayaku um, mentioned that they were worse than before. Like many of them were mentioning um, these huge uh, rains and um, storms that they were having in the community, they used to have very heavy rains before, but the um, amount of water that they are receiving now is nothing compared to what they used to have before. And that is what is, uh, that's why the rivers are racing so much. And they are always afraid that the bridges that they have, that they, um, that connect the community to, 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 the, um, to, to other communities, they are gonna be destroyed. So yes, I also, I also agree that um, we can also say that we are all experiencing um, the, the climate results, right? Like the results of not doing anything before. And one of the things that we will reflect on the course is, well, what, what should we do? What can we do? Because they are meeting every year, right? Like we have COPs every year um, and in these COPs, we are all reflecting on how they are not effective and how we have to do more. And so one of the things that we will do in the course is to come up with, uh, with ideas or initiatives to see, well, what, what can we do as citizens, right? As global citizens that we are affecting everything. So thank you very much, Terry, for that. I see one um, question here from, from David. Hi, David. Uh, could you give us an example or a few examples of Canadian Indigenous initiatives where are inspiring or deserve our support? Well, I do have a couple of, um, of ideas. I, I was amazed on 
the um, diversity of initiatives of, of uh, climate initiatives in Canada. And I will share one which is uh, which comes from the Big Trout Lake or the KI community. And um, they do have a water declaration, which is very similar to the Sarayaku declaration, actually. And I use that case in my research for the QES because the similarities are amazing how they are perceiving Mother Earth and how they are perceiving themselves as part of nature, right? Um, but one of the biggest uh, things that I learned with the KI is that through that declaration, they were able to change some of the um, policies towards their community. And they use one mechanism that I loved to learn, which is the use an occupancy map. So there is a guy that is called Terry Tobias, and I will put the name here. Um, he used this mechanism, which is use an occupancy maps, which is uh, cultural, um, applied methodology. So he goes to the communities and talk to the people in the communities, to the elders, and work on beautiful maps, which are living maps. He has a book which is called um, Living Proof. And uh, you can see all the maps that uh, he has been done. And for me, that is one a very interesting way to see how from these declarations, from these um, cosmovision applied to a declaration in an indigenous community, you can come to a very practical ways or initiatives to restore indigenous rights and to also preserve their environment um, rights as well. I don't know um, if- Could you tell me where that um, indigenous community is located? Yeah, that's in Ontario. I can share with you. Let me lay, let, let me um, that's the big trout first nation and I will share it here in the chat. Hold on. Is this one? The big trout lake first nation. I can't pronounce the the long name uh, from the First Nation. So I know it's KI. And every time that I talk to Jacob, who is um, um, my, uh, someone that I contacted from the community, he makes, he makes fun of me and I make fun of him because he can't say La Reategui. So I think <laughs> we are even. And then if you go to the um, Terry Tobias um, book, I will, I will just put it here. Terry Tobias book is called Living Proof. And he has another one. If you let me, Terry Tobias. Um, they are, so, they, they are not printing this book anymore. Sorry, Terry is with Y instead of I. Uh, they are not printing this book anymore, but because it was a very, um, it was a hit, now they are making it digital. So I'm sure the EcoTrust uh, will bring up the digital version of this book. And it's very interesting to see how Terry Tobias is able to put together maps to see how indigenous people are using and occupying the lands. And that has helped the KI community, the KI the group um, before the court because they went, uh, they have been in court a couple of times and they have showed how they are using their land. And in that way, they have been able to, um, to prevent um, industries to come into their land and to do some exploration or exploitation. So that has been very useful for them working with these maps because th those are living maps, right? Yeah. Those are maps that show how pe where people are fishing, where people are hunting. And of course, that's their way of uh, life, right? So that has been very useful in court as well. 
So as you can see, indigenous peoples have different initiatives and in order to defend their lives, they, they use different strategies like in Sarayaku, for instance, the declaration, the Sarayaku declaration was crucial when they went to the Inter-American court. And um, that was a huge, huge case. And you know what they did? The Sarayaku people brought the judges from the Inter-American court to the community. That was the first time that judges from Inter-American court uh, went out of their desks and went to a community. And it was so gorgeous to see all those pictures and videos of judges in the middle of the jungle, suffering with the hot weather and you know the mosquitoes and everything and drinking um, many different um, things from plants that they were not used to. But in that way, they were able to see what they meant, right? And uh, there was one part of the territory that still have mines and the state was saying that there were no mines there, right? So, well, when they were there, because members of the state were in this trip as well, they say, well, they said that the, the Sarayaku people said, well, if you say that there are no mines there, so there is no danger to go there, I invite you to go there and walk. Like if you're saying that it is not danger, it is not dangerous, go there and walk and then I will do it with you. And of course they didn't do it, right? Because there were mines. <laughs> so so that, that, that was a way to do it. Oh, and Thanks a lot, Paulina. <laughs> You're welcome, David. <laughs> I see Kat, Anne's cat there. Hmm. So nice. <laughs> okay. Do we have any more questions for Paulina before we close our session today? Just check the chat here. All right. One last look for hands if you're wanting to turn you, you're welcome to just turn your microphone on as well. But well, I, I just like to say I have lots and lots more questions for Paulina, but I have eight weeks to ask them. So <laughs> Thank great. You, baby. <laughs> and I hope hope that other people will also think of questions after this uh, session and uh, come and ask them at the at her course. Yes, thank you for that, David. So I did put the link um, to register for the eight week course in the chat function and also if I mean if you're here you must know where our website is so you can also look it up uh, it's under the social studies section for current courses and as I mentioned at the beginning please uh, plan to join us tomorrow at noon and Thursday at 7 p.m for our other free sessions this week and Paulina thank you so much for your time uh, today to share with us and to give us an introduction to the topic that you'll be teaching on this term and it was wonderful to meet you and to hear from you today. And I also have many questions, but uh, we'll leave it at that for today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I hope you join the course. We will have lots of times to, to share initiatives, to share ideas, to share um, also, you know, how we are all connected in this. So thank you very much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to see you all or to see some of you in the course in the next two, day, two weeks. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much, Paulina. And please visit our website and print off your brochure to see what we have this winter term. Courses are beginning on, the, on January 24th. So thank you so much. I'm going to end the session now. Thank you. Bye.